the egg writer captures the first bolt of lightning lights a candle aflame and begins to write signs of renewal and rebirth welcome to this part of the series of from table to altar and back where we visit for the first time maybe even the first time you ever captured on video of the oldest form of egg decorating in the world and to show us this tradition and lead us into this ancient mystery, we're lucky to have here today Irena Voschak, who herself learned this from her grandfather, and uh, which has been a characteristic of the entire series of From Table to Altar and Back, the handing on of family tradition. Irka, welcome to this table. Thank you, Father, for having me. Um, it's kind of fun to be here and do this and pass this along from my grandfather and my mother um, on to uh, hopefully generations that will decide, another, the next generation that will decide to um, give it a shot and see how it turns out for them. Mm -hmm. So what is it that you're doing now? It looks like you're writing. I'm writing with the pea sock onto this egg. Um, I'm melting the wax into the little holder and um, heating it in the candle taking the hot wax and actually putting the design on it as if it was a pen uh, but it's actually in wax and that is beeswax it's beeswax 100 percent beeswax i hear that there's a story behind this actual piece of beeswax well this beeswax i don't know where it came from but i know that it showed up at our house when i was very very young i don't ever remember a time of not having this piece um and we've just keep using it. It doesn't ever seem to ever go away. I don't know if it rejuvenates on its own or what it does, but it's been the family beeswax forever. And it still works. And it still works. So it, it looks like you're writing or something on the air? I am. I'm writing. I'm kind of doing my version of the Pussy Willow here. Um, just some basic lines. Uh, keep in mind that this is a raw egg because our next step will go that we'll see later when we put it into the onion skin bath the wax will disappear but the the white color will will stay and the rest of the egg will start turning brown yeah that's part of the uniqueness of this practice you remove the wax at the same time but this wax is black beeswax is in black and one of the reasons for that is because the soot in the candle uh, the smoke actually that comes out turns the beeswax black and then it's easier to see when you're writing on a light egg like this white egg here. Now these are one of the old traditions I think your mother you said uh, who come who came from Lublin uh, picked up this was part of her design yes and uh, we call it either what is it the uh, snail or the uh, the spiral sometimes it is actually an ancient design that's found on pottery in the Lublin area. So uh, there's a crossover there. And you had just mentioned that uh, was one of your mother's favorites. Right. And, you know, my grandmother, my grandmother must have um, shown this d design to my mother because my grandmother was actually from Lublin. From Lublin. My mother was born in Białystok, but my grandmother must have showed her this because she um, definitely passed it along. Um, to us, and she had to get it somewhere, so it had to be, must have been from, from my grandmother. So, you've already mentioned part of the, uh, the, what I call the uniqueness of this most ancient form of, of decoration. In other words, you put it in a warm dye bath. Just call to attention, too, if you notice that the designs are made quite thick, heavy. That also helps the end design uh, remain the white or a, a light even yellowish color underneath the wax when it's placed in the hot dye bath for the one color step uh, egg coloring. This isn't a, a technique that you're going to get perfection. Every step of the way you hope that it's going to turn out exactly the way you see it but because you're working with natural um, natural objects and uh, it's un you're out of you, you're not in control of everything so we're hard boiling these in that onion skin bath and well you know sometimes the color takes and sometimes it it doesn't sometimes it cracks and well then you have to eat it with a little onion flavor 
This is one of the aspects of this tradition here uh, for all the viewers that are watching. I call these the kitchen pisanki uh, because of the fact this is just something was made in the kitchen. A few were prepared uh, by whoever in the family uh, would know. Sometimes as it was with your grandfather or uh, and grandmother, uh, a couple people together, and they would make sure there were at least a few in the basket. But your mother kind of went overboard, didn't she? Every egg, pretty much. Um, we didn't really have any white eggs in our basket or anything at, at, uh, at Easter time. We always had them. And even if we didn't get them all um, designed and, and, and done, she would just take the regular eggs and throw them into the onion skins just to make them prettier. And, and the beauty of it was that we could eat all of them. So they went into our barish and they went into our salads and they went and we broke egg first of all. So everything was used and because it was, she felt very comfortable with it, mostly because you know, it was all natural and she felt like she wasn't giving us any chemicals, not anything. And it was just the way that we did pisanki. It, there wasn't ever an idea that we would do anything different. That natural side or ecological side is very important throughout more recent Polish history and actually all the way through the concern for the environment, uh, our stewardship of the land that we have received, not meant to abuse, but to use. And here you have a creative form of use of natural color, in this case, the onion skin, and the egg with the beeswax, which is probably from some of the beehives, which I have visited in the Lublin area, uh, that they had their own beeswax. So none of this was much really bought in the store. No, I, I don't ever remember, other than it, after they came here, obviously, and we were here, I don't th remember buying anything for coloring Easter eggs. We would start saving onion skins right after Christmas. That was the ritual. <laughs> oh, right after Christmas, it's January. We're taking down the Christmas decorations. That means that any time you use an onion, you save the onion skins so that there'd be an abundance of them. Um, so that your color, the color would be really dark. So the more skins, you, onion skins you, you have. have. The darker the, the, mm -hmm. the color. Mm -hmm. So it was something already at Christmas time, as the Christmas season died down, that you would look forward to the decorating of eggs at, at Easter. Uh, and what, what did you do with these eggs? Uh, you decorated them and then right after that? Well, right after that, we always did this. This was our Good Friday ritual. It was Good Friday is when we would do the pisanki. Mm -hmm. So um, we would, my mother would get some type of a fish um, meal for us and we would sit down and get ready to do Easter eggs and pisanki because the next day we would be going to church to bless our baskets. Ah, so these were blessed? All, all of them were pretty much blessed. <laughs> A couple dozen? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, whatever was in there and everybody wanted their egg blessed because it was, you know, you fought to see who was competition as to who, who's, who's was going to be the nicest. That's what you have in And families. the biggest compliment was when your, when your grandmother or your grandfather said, oh, don't break that, don't peel it, it's too pretty to eat. And it was the last one eaten, so, you know. So, so all the eggs that you had were blessed, first of all. Yes. And then they were all eaten. You mentioned something about sharing an egg? Well, we would share the egg on Easter Sunday at, after, after sunrise mass at, um, before our Shvinsan How we was had that? The, the, the eggs that we shared um, on Easter Sunday were peeled. Um, already and and cut and then we would put them on a platter obviously with horseradish and as a kid you know who wants to eat horseradish but it was forced <laughs> it mm -hmm. was it was you Part were going to do it you're going to do it um, and um, we would share that blessed egg first thing before we ate anything on mm -hmm. Easter Sunday we had to have that blessed egg and I now tell my family that before you put anything in your mouth you're going to have that blessed egg with horseradish with the horseradish yeah yep. and that's uh, the part of the ritual nature of the use of Polish foods, particularly at the holidays, where the exchange of eggs and probably wishes as well. Absolutely. Some words that were very personalized and uh, custom made for each person uh, were exchanged with the egg, with the horseradish, the bitterness of life, along with the egg, which is a symbol of the transformed tomb of Christ. But the egg yolk, looking at it, is the sun. The egg white is the Easter color uh, of the brilliant white robes of Jesus. So the egg was participating with the people in the sharing with exchange of wishes, uh, exchange of nourishment, uh, a taste of the bitterness of Jesus' suffering, but most of all, the victory which is proclaimed by the various 
pussy willow designs, the uh, branch designs here, the snail designs, uh, flowers, crosses, uh, extreme creativity, but very also regional as we learned with the snail here or spiral designs uh, common to the Lublin area of your mother. It, you know, was, every food in our house was sacred, but the egg was, was quite important to her because of her remembering as a child that that was, you know, how, how precious it was to her. Certain family albums, uh, we have, uh, have show actually Polish soldiers who had just come out of Siberia, out of the concentration camps and death camps of Siberia, had walked for thousands of miles, and the first thing they did on their first Easter in freedom was decorate an egg. That's how important this particular form of celebrating Easter is in our tradition. So you just changed to what looks like kind of an antique Pisak there. Yes, um, early on before you could purchase or the, the Pisak that I was using previously was available to us, my grandfather tried to make it easier on us and instead of just using a pin, he tried to formulate some Pisaki for us. So this is an old piece of wood that he had in his woodshed or in his garage um, and he put a nail on it. So we would just, I just dip it in hot and hopefully some wax adheres to it. Kind of pounded the nail around, twisted it yep. around the piece of wood. Yep, and he did a couple of different varieties. He made some that almost mimic what was um, what we have now in modern day for Pisaki. This is really something because you mentioned, well, this is, takes a little bit more effort, but on the other hand, it's wood that your grandfather actually used, formed, and, and worked that, that nail around. Uh, what does that feel like? Well, you know, it always brings a tear to my eye because um, in, no matter what and no matter how much time goes by, you miss them. But I almost remember him coming out of his woodshed and almost like a surprise, being so proud of the fact that he, he came up with a theory. He came up with a way that it was going to make it better and it was going to make it easier. So I, I look at these and I, I, I think of him and I think of that look on his face and how excited he was that he had some wood and some metal and a nail in this case or some aluminum and he was putting it together and you know I, I feel like he's always in my heart when I look at these that he's here he's you know he's part of um, you know a survivor and somebody who still found joy and um, hope and then uh, that's what and wanted to pass that joy and hope along to me so you know that that's what feels good. Now maybe we can take a look at uh, the other Pisaki, the, if you want to say the improvements from the first one that you have here? These are the very early ones. Uh, the one with the nail here is the, are the early ones that my grandfather made. This one here, um, I think he tried to do a concept and I kind of see this, um, this little well that he created, very similar to what we use today um, that makes it very easy. But he had the idea. It was there. Um, un unfortunately, he ran out of time. Maybe they, Pisaki would have, these Pisaki would have been his prototype had he had more time on this earth. The second step of the hot onion skin dye bath is actually starts with the source of the color. As you see here, the eggs, which are a brownish color, that color comes from onion skin. And maybe Irka, you can show it. How is that? How that happens? Well, we collected the onion skins, as I said, from at, right after Christmas, beginning of the year. And so, once we collected the onion skins, we put them into this water. We, once we have enough of them, just before, um, usually the week of Holy Week, we would put them into a pot and put them into some hot water, and we would let them stew for a little while, so that they would get nice and soft, and so that they uh, they would release the color. And once that was done, we were ready. This is what they look like after they've been stewing for a while. Once we've done that, we have this really pretty dark color that we're going to boil the eggs in so that the um, color comes onto the egg and the wax is removed 
revealing the design. So this is a couple days in the, is that the... Well, we used to do it maybe on Wednesday when we were ready to boil the eggs on Friday just so that they would really, really sit for a long time to release the color. So you prepare the onion skin hot bath earlier. Earlier. And it just, you know, our whole home smelled like onions for a few days. But we simmered it slowly for a while, shut it off, and then drained off most of the onion skins, reserving the water, obviously, taking out most of the onion skins. Mm -hmm. So we've heated um, the onion skins uh, water that we have just a little bit. We don't want it to be super hot because we don't want the eggs to crack. And we're going to take the eggs that we've written on with our design and place them into the, into the uh, onion skin bath. Now, the idea here is the fact that you don't want it in, in hot water because that will affect the inside of the egg and therefore some of them might crack. So as the egg gets warmer, the water warms it, and both work together. So it's not a shock for the egg, if you want to put it that right. way. So what, and another interesting aspect of this is that it also cooks the egg. Yes, so you have hard-boiled eggs. So we'll let this, you know, the ideal way is to, um, I know that people want to put things in the pot and they want to turn it on and just bring everything to a boil. And even when we do hard-boiled eggs for breakfast, uh, we want to do it quickly. Well, in order for this color to adhere well and the eggs to come, and the designs to, the wax to come off and the design to look nice, we want to really cook this low and slow. So it, this way it gives it a chance, the, the dye to, the eggshell to absorb the dye. So we're warming the eggs. Well, we're uh, uh, dyeing them at the same time right. and we're cooking them. Right. Now you have the uh, onion skins from about how many onions? A couple bags of onions? You, you know, if you if you look at an average grocery bag, probably two grocery bags full. Mm -hmm. um, you know, mm -hmm. I, I start off in a really, really full large... Full of onions or onion full skins? Full of onion skins. Ah. So I start off with a really, really big pot, um, throw it in, and I take a tea kettle and boil hot water and pour it into there so they kind of condense. And, uh, at this particular point, it would be important to highlight the fact that all, most, if not all, Pisanki started... Uh, being decorated and colored this way, not only in this method, but one white design on a solid colored egg. It was only later various forms of the of adding color were added. So this is by far the most ancient uh, form of of uh, Pisanki Easter egg decoration that we have in Western culture, and th that's why this is just a privilege, and I'm very excited. Uh, about uh, the fact that we found somebody who's not just knows how to do this or found it out in the book, but this was passed down in her family for three generations, four even. Well, we have passed it down to, um, you know, I passed it down to my nieces as well. So they're, um, they're very, they, they, they do well. I mean, they do well. They probably a little, live in more, a little bit more modern times than even I did. So they, you know, oh, let's do some, and they do it. Um, and they, they put their own twist on it, probably doesn't have the deep um, ethnic Polish Lublin or Polish roots that, that I would have or that my grandmother or my mother had, um, but it, it's there. Yes, this whole tradition continues on because carrying on a tradition always reminds me of certain people like this, a friend of mine who once visited me at the rectory. While we're waiting for these particular eggs to color, perhaps I'd show you a twist on her pin drop method using molten beeswax. We're really happy to have Mrs. Niedulczak here because for many, many years she has been one of the mainstays in most of the Easter celebrations of the Polish American Congress, the Polish uh, uh, Veterans Associations, and various other groups who prepare a special table and I always turned to Pani Niedużak for her pisanki work. So here we have uh, Mrs. Niedużak writing on the egg with the beeswax, and the beeswax I just learned today has got to be smoking. Uh, so another would be hot enough to place on the egg. Hey, Pani Krysia, when did you start writing pisanki? Well, I started after my mother passed away because before I just was too busy to do 
because it's really time consuming. But I wanted the tradition to go on, so I started doing it after my mother dead. And my children know how to do it. Diane Krisha here is one of the few people in the, around this area, around the United States, who knows how to do this so well that it comes out like it's supposed to be in a warm dye bath, which is a challenge to most uh, egg writers. But uh, that's the way you learned it from your mother, correct? Yes, I did. Mm. Something. Beautiful. Something, well. Sunrise. Well, it's... we'll also compare that to all the work that you've done in the last five years, because I have one from each year. That was a great capture, especially since Pani Krisha has recently passed. So, what's the story behind these multicolored eggs? Well, the black egg, that was, we started, um, we evolved, and so I started to um, make pisan ki that were blown out that were with color to keep forever. So I made that egg specifically for my mom. Um, as, a, as a remembrance, because she had passed down tradition to us, we had taken it to the next level. Her and I, she and I, only did the the the, east, the pisanki with the onion skins. We didn't and do. So here you had bought colors, various we bought, colors. We bought various colors and started to learn. And I started to learn to do other types of pisanki just by myself. I mean, totally self-taught. And um, when I uh, when I finally thought I had a really good technique and was doing very very well, I um, I made one specifically for my mom, which what she treasured for a it? long time. Well, it's as a as a remembrance for her and with kisses and mostly with love. Mm -hmm. um, so, so your first multicolored, if you want, multicolored, technicolored, technicolored pisanka, taking it to the to the new level. And you made it for mama. And I made it for my mother. Mm -hmm. You can see it's uh, warm already, steaming. Steam. Are they ready? Why? Well, I think yeah. I, I believe that they're ready, and they're probably hard boiled by now. Mm -hmm. um, and we should have some pretty good colors. So let's see what we've got here. Mm. So we're going to take a little bit of this um, vegetable shortening, and I'm going to take this hot egg, and I'm just going to place it into this cloth, and I'm just going to rub away all the residue and oh boy it is hot so that hot the heat actually helps it to take the wax off yes as and, well as uh, the and there's the your, shortening and there's the design and there we have it a naturally dyed Easter egg. And it's shiny cut. because of the uh, because Crisco, of the, the shortening. Me, the vegetable shortening. shortening. It's shiny because of the vegetable shortening there too, which helps take the wax off. Yes. Some of our viewers may be noticing that the uh, color is not exactly totally pure white. That's because a bit of the dye does seep into the eggshell, mm. but it gives a very nice, uh, uh, pleasing, natural yellowish color. So the more onion skins you have, and if you, the better it's going to be. And you know, when I used to uh, have the onion skins collected, and I would start putting it into the water and making the water, and I had a lot of onion skins, my mother would always say, oh, they're going to be so pretty this year. Because the more onion skins you had, the better and the darker the color was. The expectation builds slowly with the holidays, even in the collecting of onion skins, you look towards that feast. You're looking towards and kind of living by the feast and drawing much joy and hope from that. And, and for, particularly for kids, it's going to be time to make some pisanki, to write some uh, Polish Easter eggs and uh, follow this ancient tradition. As with much ritual art, it's made for the ritual. In other words, here the blessing and the sharing of the egg. So it's not meant to let be last, be around forever. It's not meant to be around forever. And uh, that's what's neat of it, because entering into the making and production, annual production, is the hype and the preparation for the season. 
and uh, the family celebration, both being together and writing the eggs, preparing all the foods, blessing them in church, uh, going to the Easter Sunday morning resurrection mass and coming home to share that egg as the first, the first food after the long, long fast. So uh, this is an important food. And this is why the ancient quality of this, the, the, the longevity, if you want to say, of this particular form, this particular method, but even some of the designs is just, just phenomenal. And uh, it's wonderful that it passed on in your tradition for so long. Well, I don't. I can't imagine Easter without having the time or making the time to make pisanki. That's important. Making the time, as everybody has time for things that they want to do. In the end, we find the time. Right, and and it's you know if you sit and you do the pisanki and you're doing them and you see them come out, it is very therapeutic. Um, you know, people are out there buying coloring books to color. Well, go get some wax. Get a pisak. Save some onion skins. And and color on an egg and have fun with it. Enjoy it with your and family. And enjoy it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Together with your family. I look at it this way. You might not even know yourself if your grandparents or great-grandparents practiced this tradition. But one thing you know they did is bless their food at Easter. And there were eggs. And usually those eggs were uh, at least colored naturally because there were no dyes to be bought. And... By practicing tr this tradition, you connect with them directly. Uh, you don't have to worry if you forgot or didn't know or didn't ask or didn't tell the story, didn't hear the t story told. But here you have told us your story, which is probably very similar to stories of other families. And therefore, by doing, writing the egg, preparing it this way, writing the uh, pisanka, we actually do what they do, and they are together with us at the holidays. A, a, a wonder, a, just a wonderful presentation here. And I, I really enjoy the fact that there's that lamb, the Paschal lamb, who's the king of the table, okay? He's got his subjects under there, the <laughs> eggs, each of one proclaiming to us uh, the tomb, the transformed tomb of Jesus Christ. The sun is the yoke on the inside, ready to be released on Easter Sunday morning for the sunrise mass and procession and the white color of the garments that are used at baptism to remind us of the purity and wonder and brilliance of the resurrection. It's all here. It's all part of a family table celebration, which you can do in your kitchen. With everything that you have at home. Right. And you don't necessarily have to produce a dozen of them. Three or, three or four in your basket is a sign that you're connected. Except that once you get started, it's kind of hard to stop. <laughs> yeah, I heard there were times you wait way, way past uh, midnight working right. on yes, them. Yes, because once you once you get rolling, you just want to make. Oh, I want to make this one. I want to make that one. Mm -hmm. I let me see what happens if I do this. So, it, you know, it does become. Um, it's very very enjoyable. It's very enjoyable. And that's one of the ways designs are developed by just continuing, continuing adding, detracting, and your own imagination. This is the Polish Easter. This is the way we celebrate Jesus' resurrection at home, the rebirth of spring, the rebirth of all creation, the sunrise of Easter, and a bountiful table that's absolutely awe-inspiringly beautiful in every step along the way. So I remember my mother used to crack eggs. You mean together? Yes. Well, we're doing that right now. All right. Why not? We used to do it at home, too. Remember, use the, what, the top part, right? The top part, not the fanny part. No, 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 no. And here we go. What do you say? Christ is, is risen. risen. Oh, ah, oh, she got me. Oh, I got you. Oh, I mine cracked. Now you have to Look eat it. Look at that. Now I got to eat it? You got to eat Already? it. Already? Well, you got to bless You got some horseradish? I do. Okay. All right. <laughs> <laughs> this is the cracked chain of death. Yours is the whole tomb, the real tomb, the victor Jesus resident from the dead.